Uh, our next speaker is uh, Christopher Clark. Uh, Christopher is, is going to be talking with us about process automation using Fourier transform near-infrared spectroscopy with a focus on applications in the oils and oilseed industry. Uh, Christopher is an application scientist uh, specializing in FTNIR process analytics for Bruker Scientific. Uh, he has over 15 years of industry experience in the field of process analytics, including the last four years with Bruker. Uh, welcome, Christopher, and I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so my name is Chris Clark, and I'm an application scientist with Bruker Applied Spectroscopy. Uh, focusing in process automation using uh, near-infrared technology. And I'm going to talk a little bit about its application uh, in the oils and oil seas industry. So I'm going to start with a, an intro into the technology itself and then talk a little bit about um, its current uses in the industry and then how to apply it uh, online or where it can be applied uh, online. So um, near-infrared spectroscopy is a type of light absorbance um, spectroscopy that is um, a type of absorbance spectroscopy that uses an incident light to irradiate a sample, depending on the type of sample you're using um, or the opacity of the sample that some of the light is going to be absorbed by the sample. Uh, and that light that is not absorbed is either going to be transmitted or reflected to a detector. Uh, and then we use the ratio of the light that reaches the detector to the incident light. Uh, and through a mathematical transformation, we arrive at something called Beer's Law, which is just a mathematical formula that allows us to use that ratio of absorbed light to quantify uh, the constituents of a sample or constituents within a sample uh, mm -hmm. using the absorbance, setting it equal to the path length, which is just the distance the light will travel through a sample, uh, the molecular extinction coefficient, which is just a unique characteristic that a, a sample has to absorb light at specific frequencies, and then to arrive at the analyte concentration, which is, of course, the thing we care about. Um, it's a type of vibrational spectroscopy, which means that it is using the frequencies of light to activate specific intermolecular energies in a bond. Um, so there are different vibrational motions that occur and they're the result of changes in dipole moment uh, in covalent bonds of, between certain atoms. Um, Bruker uses a type of spectroscopy called Fourier transform spectroscopy, which uses uh, an interferometer which just consists of a beam splitter in a mirror and a series of two mirrors that will take an incoming light source, split up the frequencies of light into two equal intensities and across a moving mirror of a motion of the mirror will create uh, interference <clears throat> patterns with the light that allow that will allow us to get at information of the sample when the light actually hits the sample. So there are different configurations of interferometers and there's flat plane interferometers. Bruker uses a type of interferometer called a cube corner, uh, whose purpose is really to provide stability um, over the use of a spectrometer um, to uh, allow it to maintain precision over increased use over a long period of time. Um, the, the technology or the, the light that actually uh, crosses an interferometer contains multiple frequencies. So it's not a, a monochromatic source. So what happens is as that the, the mirror moves, the motion will start to create this, this sum of signals. So you'll get, uh, as the frequencies go across at different uh, frequencies or different mirror positions, you get this sum of signals that will eventually result in this interferogram. Um, and the interferogram is going to contain the information of the sample. So through a Fourier transform, uh, Fourier transformation uh, that takes us from the measurement in the time domain, which is where we obtain the interferogram, to a spectrum in the uh, frequency domain, we can arrive at a single channel spectrum for a sample. 
And we then take the ratio of that single channel spectrum over the ratio of a single channel background to arrive at an absorbance spectrum. And it's this absorbance spectrum that contains the information of, from our sample. And from there, we're able to build a calibration. So NIR spectroscopy is a type of secondary method of analysis. So it uh, requires a calibration to a primary method where you'll take a sample and you'll measure it both by the, with the NIR and using the primary method that is currently being used uh, to obtain spectral data and a range of, of reference values for any of the constituents that are of interest in the sample. And then you will build a calibration model that will allow you to then take unknown samples, run them using the spectrometer and arrive at the, the quantitative information for all of the constituents that you are interested in measuring in a sample. So it's a way to um, consolidate a variety of different, more time consuming um, wet chemistry techniques and arrive at a single concise answer for all constituents of interest. And here is just an example of the result of a, a calibration. Uh, this would be one for iodine value in edible oils. Uh, and it, what you're seeing here is the predicted value versus the true value, the predicted value on the y-axis, the true value on the, on the x-axis. So this is an example of what a calibration might look like that you would then employ to predict true unknowns uh, in a QA, QC environment. Uh, one of the advantages to the principle of Fourier transform technology in near infrared is the ability to transfer methods between spectrometers. This is due to the precision in calibrating the x axis for the spectra that are obtained. And what this allows you to do is once a calibration has been developed, you can employ that calibration to any identical process anywhere in the world on any instrument without having to recalibrate or redevelop a calibration from site to site. So it provides kind of a long-term stability and an ease of transfer um, between FT instruments. Now, NIR is, is not a new technology in the oil industry. It is a well-developed, well-proven technology that is used for a variety of oil seed and oil types to quantify a variety of different constituents, IB, free fatty acids, trans fatty acids, uh, fatty acid profiles, um, different uh, in, in oil seeds, different values, moisture, protein, fiber, ash, fat. And Bruker actually has a fairly extensive catalog of a lot of these calibrations that are already developed. Uh, in addition, the AOCS recognizes NIR uh, as a standard procedure for reflectance measurements for oil mo moisture and volatile matter uh, and protein. And they have analytical guidelines for the management and development of models. What tends to be less well known or is not uh, as well appreciated is that almost any application that can be successfully performed on a benchtop can also be transferred to be used in line. So Bruker has a variety of options of probe types and designs available to allow you to go from benchtop analysis to inline process automation to get at the same results and the same quantification of your constituents for different products. Uh, and this is just a, uh, there are many different types of, of inline setups that one you could envision in a variety of different applications. The example I'm gonna use here is for a soybean installation, just a typical soybean installation where you have a, a centralized spectrometer, you can see um, on the right side of your screen and you have it 
uh, in a, a control room leading out into the process area. In this example, we have it set up to six different sample locations all in process. And you can envision in a soybean installation from the incoming beans through their process, uh, the, the processing of the, the beans themselves, and then even potentially an extraction for, for crude oil, putting a, a measurement that would allow you to automate um, the results you obtain as the beans are going through the various processing stages in production. Uh, the results can be sent out to a DCS or a control room. So the entire process, the entire production can be automated. Um, and then, so that, and again, with, in, in many cases, the level of reliability and precision um, that uh, can be achieved or a similar precision that can be achieved in a benchtop application. Uh, this is just a, uh, an example of uh, a potential installation for soy soybean uh, analysis. So this is a meal line where you have a reflectance measurement a reflectance probe that is installed in this case just above an open conveyor. In many cases, you'd see it in a, attached to the side of a, of a conveyor or a chute or a hopper. Um, but you can see the light being shown on to the sample itself. So it's reflecting uh, and the information that is contained in the return light will provide us information about the constituents of the sample. In this case, lowering it into the sample to achieve a desired path length distance between the source and the sample itself. And this allows us to get at um, sort of a real time trending to be able to quantify the, prod, uh, the, the constituents in production without the need for the time delays, the costs or the infrequency that would otherwise be um, be seen if you were doing everything manually. And you can see this is just an example of uh, fat trending over time. Uh, the orange uh, the orange line represents the results from the spectrometer, uh, and the red X's represent uh, grab samples that were pulled and run to test against the results of the spectrometer. And you can see a pretty tight correlation with how the analyzer is actually reading versus um, what the lab results are showing. So this is conceptual proof that you can use this technology to accurately monitor your process in more real-time fashion. And so we're going to make it fairly short and sweet today, but that's my intro to near infrared in the, as a, a process tool for automation in the oil seeds and oils industries. And I'm so happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, Christopher, thanks a lot for that presentation. I uh, just had one question since we're looking at a comparing a primary method, I mean, could you maybe comment a little bit on the, the how closely we might check uh, compared to a primary method? Sure, so it's going to be a little bit dependent, of course, on the, um, on the precision of your primary method. So there's always the need to, to kind of understand what the error of your method is. But uh, we've seen in practice, especially in a lot of the oil uh, applications themselves where in many cases, the, uh, the results of the uh, NIR analysis or the NIR calibration can be uh, as accurate. You can't get more accurate than the primary method, of course. Um, but in some instances, you can improve on the precision of the, of, of the primary method. So, um, you know, there, there is the ability to achieve the, the accuracy of the primary method, and in some cases, to even improve on the precision of the of the primary. Thanks. 
Um, and just one other quick question. Is there a maximum length where we can uh, run the fiber from the instrument uh, when, we're, when we're trying to automate a process? Sure, it depends a little bit on the, uh, the probe type. Uh, generally speaking, for a reflectance measurement, um, you are going to want to stay within 100 to 120 meters. Um, and then for um, certain types of transmission measurements, you can go longer than that, 150 uh, meters or even a little above that is, is, is possible. Well, listen, thank you very much for this presentation.